This video was sponsored by Brilliant. Hey, Happy Friday. This week, Microsoft announced some disappointing upgrades to their Surface line. PC sales across the world are on the decline for everyone except for maybe Apple. And Meta and Microsoft also announced some exciting updates for the Metaverse. Welcome to the Friday Checkout. Okay, we'll start the brief with the most silly announcements from Google in a very long time. There are now gaming Chromebooks from Acer, Asus, and Lenovo with RGB keyboards, 120 hertz displays, and access to thousands of games via cloud game streaming. I bet these were supposed to specifically feature Stadia at launch, but awkwardly enough, Google has of course just killed that off. So instead, they are featuring the services of xCloud and Nvidia. That is extremely awkward and well done, Google. Also this week, Samsung had its usual yearly developer conference, and while they briefly mentioned One UI 5 and a couple of other things, they spent most of their event talking about the smart home. Samsung's SmartThings ecosystem is set to work better with Matter now, which is the new open standard for smart home ecosystems, which even Apple, Google, and Amazon are party to. For example, Google Home devices will actually soon work with the Samsung SmartThings app, and vice versa. Finally, the walled gardens around smart home ecosystems are crumbling, and that is a fantastic thing. Then, Sony also did something really interesting, releasing its first over-the-counter hearing aids soon after the FDA removed requirements on prescriptions or hearing aid exams or whatever back in August. Very nice. And finally, NASA also confirmed that smashing a satellite into an asteroid in space is even more powerful than we hoped, and so we may be able to deflect asteroids coming towards Earth in the future. Very cool. All right, that's it for the brief. Links to all the newly announced products are down in the description, including to all the brand new Surface devices that will make up my first story of the week, although I don't actually recommend buying those in particular. So Microsoft actually had two separate events this week. First, the Surface event, and then one day later, Microsoft Ignite, the company's big IT conference. Fun fact, Microsoft actually delayed their Surface conference by a day after they heard it was on the same day as Facebook's big VR event, which kind of shows how little confidence they had in their own hardware announcements, in my opinion. There were refreshes in the form of the Surface Pro 9, the Surface Laptop 5, and the new Surface Studio 2 Plus, and the latter two were just really confusing spec bumps. The Laptop 5 actually dropped AMD chips this year, despite AMD chips being very competitive, and despite AMD supporting Microsoft's own Pluton security chip, which Microsoft itself describes as the, quote, future of Windows PCs. And instead, this year, the Laptop 5 only features Intel chips with, of course, no Pluton and the same old design. So that's kind of a side grade at best. Similarly, the Studio disappointed by featuring an 11th gen quad-core Intel CPU when the 13th gen is basically just around the corner, and also a laptop-grade NVIDIA 3060 card. That means that this supposed flagship computer is at least one whole generation behind right now out of the gate for over $4,000 and it still features last generation's designs. Really the only proper upgrade this year is that the Pro 9 now comes with both Intel chips starting at $999 or a third generation Snapdragon chip with 5G starting at $1299 in the same chassis just with some new colors. This weirdly means that the ARM version is the more expensive one, and what bothers me the most is that neither version actually has a headphone jack anymore, despite the rest of the chassis staying exactly the same compared to last year's Pro 8. That means Microsoft actually just ripped the headphone jack out and gave nothing else in return for it, which... Yeah. I personally really want a good ARM-based Surface Pro device, that would be my dream form factor, but this generation of Surface devices kind of just seems iterative and compromised. Now, on the software front, there are some better news. First, Apple announced that iCloud is going to work with the Windows 11 Photos app for photo integration between your iPhone and your Windows computer, while Apple Music and Apple TV are coming to Windows 11 via the store next year, which is nice. And second, Microsoft also announced Designer. This is a new app that uses Doll E2 to help generate designs for stuff like presentations and posters as part of Office 365, which itself is now also getting rebranded to just Microsoft 365. 
I kind of feel like losing the Office brand is a weird move when it's such a recognizable, strong brand, but uh, okay. Okay, my second story of the week is going to be somewhat related, and it is the PC industry having a pretty tough time. Research firms Canalys, Gartner, and IDC all reported worldwide PC sales being down bad in the third quarter, somewhere between 15 and 19.6% year over year. The analysts blamed the downturn on a recession and global economic difficulties, lockdowns in China, and the fact that the pandemic-driven boom is just over. In fact, the PC market had been on a steady decline before the pandemic since 2011 for almost a decade, giving way to phones and tablets, and the recent craze for work-from-home setups might have brought demand forward a few years, meaning that now that everyone bought their PCs, we're actually going to go back to even heavier declines again. There is one big question mark between the three firms though, as Apple's numbers vary wildly between the three of them. IDC said that Apple was up 40%, massively outperforming all competitors, and soon even overtaking Dell for the third place. Canalis said that Apple was more or less static, which would still be above average in a falling market, while Gartner actually had Apple down 15.6%, about in line with the rest of the industry. The only explanation that I can think of for these huge differences between the firms is that maybe they count shipments across quarters differently, but still Apple seems to be doing at least somewhat better than the rest of the industry. Either way, the PC as a category is having a tough time for sure, and I don't think that Microsoft doing as weakly as they did with their upgrades are going to have a good time in this environment. Okay, and for my last story of the week, Meta actually held its Meta Connect 2022 event with some pretty major announcements, including with Microsoft. You have probably heard the big headlines of your Meta avatars finally getting legs. Amazing, but of course there was a lot more to talk about, starting with the MetaQuest Pro, a higher-end VR headset for $1499, plus controllers for an extra 300 bucks. That is way more expensive than the $400 Quest was, and for that it has a better Snapdragon processor, more RAM, full face and eye tracking that actually works on device without having to connect to the internet, full color pass-through using the cameras to offer mixed reality, and the controllers actually being able to track themselves instead of having to rely on the headset. So this headset is supposed to relatively easily switch between full VR, blocking out your complete vision, or AR, where you can look out of the headset, kind of through the headset with cameras. And for this, it actually has space between your face and the headset on the bottom here, so you have some peripheral vision, you can maybe see your keyboard in front of you, and so on. Unlike the regular Quest, the Pro is also pitched more as a productivity device, so imagine putting up multiple virtual displays and video conferencing. And interestingly, Microsoft sort of co-announced bringing Windows apps like Word, Excel, Teams, and Xbox Cloud Gaming to MetaQuest, and even the ability to stream a full Windows desktop seamlessly. Now, I find this partnership interesting because both Meta and Microsoft hyped it up as a really big deal, and Satya Nadella actually went and appeared at the Meta conference, but he did not appear at his own company's Surface conference. So, uh, yeah, that kind of gives you an idea of scale. And as a reminder, Microsoft was originally huge on their own mixed reality platform. They were the first company to do VR with inside-out tracking with cameras on the headset and pass-through and everything. I even have one of their original Dell Visor headsets from 2017. They tried making productivity in VR a thing before anyone else, including allowing people to open regular Windows programs in VR. And they of course also own HoloLens, which they pitch almost exclusively as an enterprise solution these days. So Microsoft, like five years ago, did most of the things that Meta is trying to do today, but then they kind of just got bored with it and lost interest and scaled back on it. And now instead of really pushing their own platform very hard, they're starting to adopt that of Meta. I think Microsoft saw that Meta is spending $10 billion a year and maybe spending up to $88 billion in total. And they decided that they're not willing to burn that kind of cash to compete with them to own the platform that might or might not take off, and instead they just focus on shipping their apps on top of a Meta's attempt instead. Just like they have decided to ship their apps on Android and iOS instead of trying to fight for a Windows Phone foothold. As with Windows Phone, I kind of feel that that's a bit sad, but just like with Windows Phone, I also kind of agree that it's probably the right choice. 
So Meta, Microsoft with Ignite, and Samsung with Samsung Developer Conference all had their big developer conferences this week, meaning that just in the last few days, three of the world's biggest tech companies tried their very best to convince developers to build stuff for their platforms. And if becoming a developer that companies like these are trying to woo on a daily basis, if that sounds like an exciting career path for you, then check out Brilliant. Brilliant is the best place online to study science, maths, computer science, and engineering. Courses cover everything from simple coding and algorithms to machine learning, quantum computing, and more. And they're actually designed by professionals from institutions like Microsoft, Google, MIT, and more. So you know that they actually teach the exact things that those institutions are looking for. The courses cover topics from beginner to advanced levels, and what's really special about them is that they are super interactive. Each big concept is broken down into smaller chunks that are easy to digest on their own, and those are then practiced right away with an exercise to make sure that the learnings actually stick. This is a super effective way to learn, and Brilliant works great on both desktops and phones. You can try Brilliant for free at brilliant.org TFC, and the first 200 people who sign up using that link will also get 20% off their annual premium subscription. So check them out. Links are down in the description, and uh, I'll see you next Friday.